Ah, Jamestown, the town that never ceases to amaze me with its history. As we saw in the last video, the relationship between Plymouth and the Indians was one of peace and harmony for about 50 years. However, Jamestown got off to a rocky start with the Indians in Virginia. As I mentioned a few videos ago, Jamestown struggled in the beginning before the arrival of Thomas Dale. The men there did not want to work and went out painting for gold only to find iron pyrite or fool's gold. That valuable time they could have been spending planting crops. Instead, they chose to pan for gold and cheat the Indians. The settlers there relied on the Indians' generosity for their substance, and why the Indians even bothered to help them is beyond me, since the settlers treated them so poorly and constantly cheated them. Ever since John Smith left the colony back in 1609 to go back to England, the relationship between the English and the Indians continued to sour. From the years 1609 to 1613, there were some skirmishes between the Indians and the English, but nothing too major. A lot of one side stealing items of value from the other side, and it went both ways. Finally, in 1613, the English grew tired of the antics of the Indians, and instead of stealing items and capturing regular people, they decided to capture Pocahontas. She was Chief Powhatan's daughter. They captured her to try to force the return of the English that they had captured and the weapons they had stolen. In 1614, while Pocahontas was living in captivity among the English, she was taught the English ways and Christianity and had even converted and was baptized as Rebecca. She would have been around 18 years old at this time. John Rolfe, who was a colonial official of Jamestown, had fallen in love with Pocahontas or Rebecca and desired to marry her. He obtained permission to marry her from both her father, Chief Powhatan, and the Virginia governor, Thomas Dale. Remember, he was the guy that would shove a needle through your tongue if you took the Lord's name in vain. The marriage actually helped the colony with the relationship with the Indians, and for the time they were married, the relations actually improved between the newly established colony and the Indians. The peace through the marriage was known as the Peace of Pocahontas. The Rolfs had a son together who they named Thomas, and they were together till the day of her death just a few years later when they traveled to England together in hopes of attracting more people for the colonies. While she was there, she became ill and died in 1618. In their four short years of marriage, it was Pocahontas that showed John Rolfe the plant that would forever change the colony of Virginia, tobacco. Oh, and spoiler alert, after Pocahontas died, the relationship between Jamestown and the Indians went to the pooper. Tobacco, the little plant that was introduced to the colonists by Pocahontas. She showed them the pipe and the cigar, and back then it was even hailed as a cure for all kinds of ailments. John Rolfe was experimenting with the local crop and thought it was, quote, poor and weak and of biting taste. In short, he didn't like it very much. However, he was able to acquire some Trinidad tobacco seeds. How he came to acquire these seeds, well, those details are actually lost to history. But he did, and he began to grow the new tobacco. Due to the fertile Virginian soil, his experiment was a success. The new tobacco was hailed as being a match to the tobacco that was exported from Spain or even better. In the first few years from 1615 to 1616, they were only able to produce about 2,300 pounds of the plant. But by 1618, they were exporting 50,000 pounds of tobacco. Remember, they still owed a very large debt to the Virginia Company, so getting some revenue into them was a priority. In England, this sparked a debate as tobacco began flooding their market with slogans such as, Hail thou inspiring plant, thou balm of life, well might thy worth engage two nations' strife, exhaustless fountain of Britannia's wealth, thou friend of wisdom, thou source of health. Obviously, that was touted in the pro-tobacco camp. But then there are other such slogans, such as, Tobacco, that outlandish weed, it spends the brain and spoils the seed, it dulls the spirit and dims the sight, it robs woman of her right. And as you could probably guess, that came from the anti-tobacco camp. Either way, the tobacco crop being raised in Virginia was a hit, and it was being hailed as a rival to the tobacco that Spain was growing and exporting. And in order to keep up with the profit and the demand, the colony had to make a difficult decision. They were faced with men having to continue to grow the crop of tobacco, but the leaders were afraid that more people were going to grow tobacco, instead of food, and they would revert to the state of the starving period that Jamestown had faced just less than 10 years prior. 
Remember, people were willing to pan for gold instead of growing crops to survive in order to get rich quick. And the leaders rightfully feared this crop because once again it distracted the settlers from planting corn to survive. The leaders constantly discouraged its cultivation and once again the settlers were hit with the inability to feed themselves and had a lack of workers willing to plant corn. So, in order to solve this problem, another problem was introduced into the colony. In the year 1619, Africans were taken from Angola, West Africa by the Portuguese. They were transported on board from the Portuguese ship San Juan Bautista and were en route to Veracruz in Mexico. This was part of the Atlantic slave trade route. While they were nearing their destination, two English ships sailing under a Dutch mark, the White Lion and the Treasurer, attacked the San Juan Bautista and robbed them of about 50 to 60 slaves. The White Lion sailed on to Virginia where it landed at Point Comfort, what would be present-day Hampton at the end of August. And according to John Rolfe, he wrote, and I quote, 20, and odd Negroes, were bought for victuals." It should be noted that the majority of the slaves that were bought were bought by people who were more wealthy and affluent figures in Jamestown, such as George Yeardley and Abraham Piersley. A few days after the White Lion had left, the treasurer had finally made landfall and sold a few more slaves to the colonists in Jamestown. By March of 1620, about 32 Africans were recorded to be living in Jamestown as slaves, and they would be the first of hundreds of thousands of slaves that would be introduced to America. This blight of slavery did help solve the problem that Jamestown was facing, of not having enough laborers to plant tobacco and corn. By 1640, tobacco was being exported to England at nearly 1.5 million pounds per year. Now, this is not to excuse anyone from any past action, but it is very easy to look at them through the our lens and to see how degenerate these people might have been based off of a cultural norm that they were used to. It was normal for people during this time to have slaves. Slavery was not an American-only institution. It is as old as humankind. Blacks enslaved blacks, whites enslaved whites, Asians enslaved other Asians, Arabs enslaved other Arabs. Slavery is a worldwide institution, and it was not unique to the United States. Again, I want to make this crystal clear. I am not condoning slavery in any way. Slavery bad. Very bad. I am merely just pointing out that it was a common solution in this day and age. But to say that it is a white institution or a tool just used by the white man to keep other races oppressed is historically inaccurate and factually incorrect. And in some cases, even manipulatively evil, just simply to push a white hate agenda. And so with this will be a perfect segue into my next video. But you guys let me know what you think down in the comments below and I'll catch you guys in the next one. And by the way, the next one is going to be that slavery is not unique to the United States.